Let's see. Thanks everybody for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Konnichiwa, ohayo gozaimasu, wherever you're calling in from. My name is Doug Brunke. I'm the founder and CEO of Global Chamber. I'm very pleased to kick off the next meetup program for Global Chamber in Japan. And we have four speakers on four different cities, and we're going to hear from each of them about some of the business developments that are going on there. Um, I have behind me an iris garden, which is one of my most favorite places in Tokyo. Um, it's right near a, a client of mine I used to call on, Arai Seisashiko, uh, Arai Oil Seal Company in Tokyo in an industrial area. And there was this little beautiful iris garden. And I think they probably, it happens like in July, right? It doesn't last like forever, but when it comes blooming, it's just such an amazing thing. And, and I think for all of us that have experienced Japan, we recognize that there's a lot of things going on, but there are so many quiet places that bring us pleasure. Um, and that's one of the places in the world that has given me pleasure. And I really appreciate all of you, what you bringing to the table and your support of Global Chamber, particularly Alexandra Scott. I'd like to recognize you and maybe have you kick things off today. Alexandra was one of six interns for Global Chamber this summer. Uh, I will say there's two things about Alexandra, at least, that should be noted. Number one was she was the youngest of the interns. The other four all were graduates of college, and, and four of them were master's students at Thunderbird. Alexandra is a sophomore at Pomona College, and despite the fact that she was the youngest, and the least experienced, I would say she she was, if not the most impressive, the, the most impressive intern that we had this summer. And I think some of you who have interacted with her recognize that she has a certain uh, way about her that's, especially for those of us that work uh, with Japanese people, uh, the respect and the communication skills and her whole approach was very important and very helpful for us to make progress over the last several months. So Alexandra, are you there? And could you just say a few words to kick things off today and maybe what some of your expectations are relative to today's program? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And Doug, thank you so much for your kind words. I'm very, very touched. It's, you know, it was absolutely such a pleasure to work with the Global Chamber. And although I'm currently back here in Claremont, California, um, in my dorm at Pomona College, so um, you know I may no longer be an active intern with Global Chamber, but I'm absolutely always a point of contact. I'd love to keep in touch with everyone that I interacted with because I had I made such meaningful friends here at the Global Chamber. Um, and so I just thank you all so much for your kindness and your support. Um, and with regard to today's program, I know we're going to be hearing from four different speakers about different cities in Japan, and they're just going to give a brief five minute, three to five minute or so um, background about the city that they're representing and why that city has some really great business opportunities, you know, maybe throw in some fun facts here and there um, about those places. So I know um, one of them is Yoshinori Nishiki-san, who is a uh, global advisor for Osaka. And I know, Nishiki-san, I know you have a little bit of a time constraint. So would you be interested in starting us off today? Yeah, uh, thank you for introducing me, uh, Alexandra. Yeah, uh, nice to meet you. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, I'm Yoshi from Osaka. So let me, I'm representative, I'm, a, I'm a advisor for Osaka uh, Global Chamber. So let me share my screen. So, 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 so Cesar, do we have um permissions for, oh, okay. yep, we're all good, awesome. Okay, can you see? Okay. We, can, we can see that if you can make it a little bit larger, that would be awesome. There you go. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Osaka. Uh, uh, yeah, I, let me introduce uh, how 
our saga is interesting and yeah so yeah according to the first growing uh, destinations ranking published annually by a major u.s great company the average growth rate over the past eight years has been the highest in the world for two consecutive years 2016 and 2017 yeah so yeah this is uh, before coronavirus uh, happened you know, it, it has been even uh, Cyprus, Japan's capital, Tokyo. Why is Osaka attracting so much uh, attention from international travelers? Yeah. Okay, so Osaka is known for its uh, gourmet foods. There's even a saying, Kuidaure, uh, which means to spend so much money on food and drink that one lo loses one's fortune. From uh, Yatai, uh, it's, which is street uh, stores. And and to Michelin Guide restaurants, and you can enjoy a wide variety of foods. The New York Times also introduced Osaka as one of the uh, places to go in 2017. And shitting uh, the quality of the uh, citing the quality of the food culture as a reason, as a ultimate Japanese piece to await. Okay, and then Osaka is also, uh, uh, and also Osaka, when it comes to Osaka, uh, many people answer that it's a, a city of laughter. That is how many Osaka people are funny and have a sense of humor. And then 20, so yeah, I want to highlight that 2015 and 2025 20, international exposition, uh, exposition will be held in Osaka for the first time in 55 years and is attracting worldwide attraction as the next major e event following the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and the Paralympics. Okay, yeah. Uh, now, in terms of the business, uh, about the location of Osaka, Osaka serves as a gateway between Japan and the rest of the world, including Asia, Kansas International Airport, the hub of the city country, connecting 89 cities in 25 countries, regions, and with its 24 hour operation, it is well served by international carrier flights. So, this is a uh, uh, before coronavirus situation. And the uh, next one connects concentration and a huge market. The Kansas region with its unique cities of Osaka, Kobe, and Kyoto is a huge market with a population of 25 million and a GDP of approximately around 100 trillion yen and plays a central role in the economy of Western Japan as a business have along with Tokyo and as a metropolitan areas. And Lastly, yeah, I want to highlight the cost of the advantages and compared to Tokyo, office rent and labor costs uh, are about 40% and 50% lower, respectively, in Osaka. So, yeah, that's why I want to highlight that, uh, how Osaka is great for the business and to travel. So, yeah, uh, thank you for uh, taking time to yeah to listen to my uh, presentation yeah thank, thank you nishiki san uh could you tell us a little bit about you what is it that yeah, you're in? yeah yeah oh yeah now i country uh uh concert, consultant to support the the, uh, the company uh, that uh, enter the japanese market or uh, the company that uh, enter the foreign market also i was i'm a representative of the Bangladesh software company. Yes. So you're so you're helping companies land in Osaka from foreign countries, and you're also helping Japanese companies go to other countries. Yes. Yeah. Not only yeah Osaka. Yeah, but the mainly yeah I support the company which related related to Osaka. Or is it typically technology companies, or what? What types of companies typically are your uh, ones to work with? So far, mainly the yeah uh, IT related company because I can support especially for the uh, regarding software. 
software. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Uh, yeah. Are you originally right. from the, the Kansai area? Um, yeah, yes, Kansai area, but it's uh, not uh, Osaka, it's uh, near Nagoya, uh, which is uh, Mie prefecture. Got it. Very yeah. good. Thank okay. you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. What, what, uh, what questions do people have for Nishiki san? <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourself and just, just go ahead. Nishiki san is a global advisor for Global Chamber, and uh, thank you for your support uh, and also the support of the companies. Does anybody have any questions for Nishiki san? Alexandra, um, you've, you were the one that found Nishiki san, I think, and so you two have spoken a bit over the, over the, uh, the summer. Uh, what have been some of your, uh, what have you been impressed with relative to Nishiki san and his work? Yeah, absolutely. I know I first met Nishiki san actually through um, Jason Ball's business in Japan, who I know Jason is here now. Um, and I think, you know, I was just really amazed by Nishiki san's desire to build a more international community. Nishiki san, I know you mentioned that um, you were really interested in seeing Japan kind of go abroad and you know, start to make more business connections um, outside of just Japan. And so I think that, you know, really spoke to me as this is someone who would be a great, great addition to the Global Chamber community. Um, and I know, Jason Ball, would, is there anything you'd like to add, you know, about business in Japan? Uh, no, not really, but I had a, uh, a question for Yoshi. Is there any whisper is there any uh, inside knowledge from uh, what's going on in Osaka as to when Japan might open the borders a little bit more make it a little <laughs> bit easier to come to Japan <laughs> good question oh yeah it's uh, your question it's uh, after coronavirus station what if that never ends <laughs> It's not going uh, to uh, yeah. So yeah, I actually yeah, uh, uh, most of uh, business that I involved in uh, are uh, very slow since there there been yeah because of the COVID nineteen. But I but still some companies uh, interested in entering the Japanese market. So yeah. I think uh, it's very slow, but still there's an opportunity uh, to come in, in yeah, I, Japan. I've heard um, that if you come for business reasons, mm -hmm. you, you can get a visa, it, uh, that the process is quite yeah, yeah, it says, and yeah. you need sponsorship yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. from your sponsor to track you and uh, take responsibility for you. But someone recently in business in Japan said they've built a process to make it as simple as possible to gain um, mm -hmm. a visa for business. So if anyone's interested, that's I Matthew. Put them on. Yeah, I think Matthew it Kyle. Is Matthew. It is mm. Matthew. Yeah. He, he, he's doing what? He's last time. He's well, working he's, on he's that. Did, or? No, as Jason's saying, he's built a process, right, to make it shorter for your time frame it takes to get a visa so he's got a magical formula apparently right jason yeah I, I haven't looked into the detail but i simply i think it's it's possibly uh, a little bit of knowledge from experience and a little bit of actually helping people to actually put it all together uh, matthew's wife was mm -hmm. was here last uh, last um uh, global climate chamber japan call the, um, we did an event a couple days ago with Anne um, where we, um, it was a team building exercise and we found out that many of the people on the, the call, including everybody in my group wants to visit Japan next year. So this is a very important question. Uh, Catherine, you intimated recently that you were not so optimistic or was it just you were just frustrated maybe <laughs> no i think it's just a built in, a built up a, a build up of frustration amongst people who've been here and we love japan and we've been supporting japan i'm here 20 years now this year and so you know i, I spend a lot of time yoshi i spent four years in osaka working with panasonic as their in-house legal counsel so love wow. japan and just getting to the point where 
people got there before us, the frustration level, but even us long term lovers of Japan are getting to that level, which I think indicates where we're at. If we are getting to that level, right, when we normally will be like, no, fine, it'll, it'll be fine, they'll open up. But um, as in my role as uh, legal services and IP committee co chair of the, the American Chamber of Commerce, we've been applying pressure and the newspapers are asking for comments from us three, four times in this last week. So wow. the business community can continue to pu- apply a little bit of pressure to Japan and the government. And so we're doing that as much as possible. And so they've said the middle of this month that, you know, PCR tests are going to disappear. And then we expect that something's going to happen after that. But we just don't know. It hasn't been announced officially. Wow. What do you think, Jason? What What are you hearing against the rail? Yeah, I mean, uh, they recently lifted the cap of the, the size of the groups that can come in organized um, tourism, which was never the problem, but <laughs> they've lifted it. And testing, they've lifted the um, PCR testing requirement from most countries, not all. So there's some progress, but it's it's hard, as Catherine was saying, for long-term uh, Japan committed foreign business people to understand what exactly is the, is the challenge here? I mean, um, what's the backlash going to be if they open it up? Who's holding this up? We're, we're not quite sure. Yeah, there's a perception that the virus comes in from outside, but Japan has not been open to the outside for quite a while. And so um, even the prime minister got it and he got it after four vaccinations. So it's kind of showing to the public, if they're listening, that it's not really an outside thing. It's it's happening here and get on with it. But I think there's the pressure, perhaps, Jason, on the hospital system. Um, how are they going to cater for foreigners coming in who may not have the resources if they have to go to hospital and be looked after? But I think that's all things you can plan in at the front end, right? Have the required amount of insurance and those sorts of things. But it seems that instead of just getting rolling with it and working as we go, it's a a bit of a got to have it right and perfect before we roll it out. Um, So, you know, we're looking forward to the 20,000 cap a day going up to 50,000. But again, as as Jason said, it's organized tours and there's a lot of paperwork and you can't deviate from what you said you were going to do on your itinerary. So we're still waiting to come on Japan. We just like we were there holding the balloons and the firecrackers and everything we want it to happen, but it's just taking a very long time. We will be letting you know, Doug, as soon as we know something really fabulous is happening. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, (laughs) Kelly Moore is somewhat of, I guess you're kind of an official uh, person, right, with the government, not representative of the government, but working closely. Is there anything that you would like to share on your perspective of what you think might be? uh, Well, I understand, well, I'll tell you some of my experiences, but I went to dinner last week with a person from the con- from the embassy, not the consulate, from Washington, and he was expressing f- frustration because I don't know why we're doing this. Uh-huh. And he, he thought, and I think the point was made, he goes, there's just as many cases with or without tourism coming in. And also, I think I think the, the, pre, the COVID, the pre-flight test stops, they're going to suspend that on September 7th. Mm. It hasn't been official yet, but I, the, those are the dates that are being bandied about. And, okay. and we get calls every single day, me, me, we, the, the Tempe office, and business people can go there, but you have to, you, know, you have to fill out these forms and they have something called the EFRS system. Is that, is that the acronym for it? Which is sort of a Ministry of Health thing that guarantees people going, you're not gonna go there and get stuck get sick and and end up in a hospital. So the people who invite you have to provide this thing, but you can get a a business visa fairly easily. You could visit, you can visit family and even long-term residences. And so somebody who lives there, who's not Japanese, you can get, you can visit them now. Mm. The tourism still is not allowed. I mean, you, you, you join a tour group and you do what they say, apparently. Yeah, it, uh, about two weeks, two or three weeks ago, in the Economist, Economist magazine, they had a little sort of kind of tongue-in-cheek article saying this sounds like fun. 
and they were describing what you had to go through to be a tourist in Japan. You know, you go where they say to go, sit in a restaurant where they tell you to sit, don't talk to anybody, and wear a mask. And <laughs> so yeah. people, are, people are making fun of it right now. So it, it, hopefully it'll change. I mean, I haven't been in two years. It's okay. I can't go. Yeah. Do you and your wife have a planned trip? Well, we don't, we don't want to go in the summer anyway. That's pretty miserable, but now we, yeah, we've been talking about well, maybe in April, maybe at the end of, of the fall before Christmas, and if that doesn't work out, maybe in the spring, then we could get there. It, you know, it, it, I just don't want to go through all the steps, to be quite honest. Okay. Yeah. I'm targeting the uh, Kamakura Matsuri in uh, uh, Akita Camp in February, but well, we'll uh, you, but keep your, you can go by then. For, uh, okay. Maybe. I, can I maybe. add something else, Doug? Just I do know from two groups that are organizing two large conferences here, one in October, one in November, and they're getting support from local, um, as in Japan Chamber of Commerce and Tokyo Chamber of Commerce to, su to support the visas. So if you've got 50 or 60 people coming in, more than that even, the chamber are supporting the visa applications. Oh, and so they're doing all the guarantees. But oh. in the background, with the groups coming through, um, they're doing memorandums with their members to say, Japan is sponsoring you for this, but you know you are on the line. You agree to pay all the fees. If you go missing, they're not responsible for you. So there's this background agreement that people will agree to before they come. So they're getting all the help on Japan's side, but they're making sure that on the other country side that the people are acknowledging, right, that they're coming in here and it's all up to them. They're just lucky to get the help from Japan. So it is possible. And these two conferences will go ahead, one's in Tokyo, one's outside of Tokyo, and they're going full steam ahead, uh, which is quite remarkable. It's probably one of the, the two situations. I can give you some more information later, Doug. But okay. it is possible. It is doable. You do need immensely the help. And I think, you know, someone like Oz, um, Yoshi in Osaka, he probably knows the local our chambers there too so it can be done it's just there's a bit of a you know in the background another side agreement shall we say where people thank you for getting me in but i know i'm fully responsible for when i get there everything else right sounds yeah. good yeah we, we we better keep moving especially given um uh, miho tanaka tanaka san for talking about sapporo it's quite late in europe where she is and so tanaka san could you take us on a journey to Hokkaido. You know, Kelly Moore was just talking about how hot the summers are. He's used to traveling um, Honshu, uh, but in Hokkaido, it's beautiful this time of year in the summer. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and could you uh, introduce us to some opportunities uh, in the Sapporo and, uh, area and in Hokkaido, Ken, please. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, invitation. And yeah, so I'm going to present about like what uh, Hokkaido and Sapporo provides right now. And yeah, I'm going to briefly explain about the, like how this ecosystem is working right now. It's pretty um, like new, but um, we are trying to build it from the like bottom up approach. So let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay. We Perfect. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So um, today I'm going to present um, on behalf of Startup City Sapporo, which is a, a project created by Sapporo City in Hokkaido. And I am mainly in charge of Startup Visa there. So where is it? So it's the north part of Japan. This is um, very famous for, let's see, the best part of snow in the world. And so many like people are visiting uh, Hokkaido especially Niseko to like ski and also snowboarding. And also like Osaka has amazing food, but also like Hokkaido has the most fresh sushi in the world, I'm sure. So like you have to visit and try it. It's the quality is like just extraordinarily amazing. So um, the basic information about Sapporo City. So basically everything you need is concentrated in Sapporo. So Sapporo City has 2 million uh, population and it is our first largest city in Japan aside from Tokyo. And also we have a lot of financial support, especially for seed uh, financing. And also we have several spaces. 
like incubation hub and also we Sapporo is actually famous for uh, like IT talents so like, it's not really famous yet but actually it was known as an IT valley like Sapporo valley um around like 2000 and yeah it's trying to also like attract a lot of engineers again and there is a uh, like a lot of AI engineers here as well for example um like there are several AI based uh, tech companies based in Sapporo and some of the companies already raised like Series C. And like, so like they are actually leading the AI uh, tech half there. So cluster. So I think Sapporo's cluster is a bit different from the rest of the world. Not <laughs> world, sorry, rest of Japan. And so um, we have, for example, like biotech and health tech cluster in Sapporo because like we have one of the top national universities in Japan called Hokkaido University there. And also like Sap Hokkaido is like has huge land. So uh, we are the home space for food tech and agri-tech cluster. And the important thing is like also we have space tech cluster because this is the perfect land to actually launch a rocket. And it, they are planning to create a first like rocket launch hub in Asia that like also private companies and also public sectors can use together. So it's going to be launched in 2025 next like soon. So uh, they're actually trying to create a like, community for space tech companies as well. And so I want to talk about startup visa because like so many like Japanese cities provide startup visa, but actually um, Sapporo just created a like amazing initiative for this. So um, we, uh, started to accept all the application in English. And also a few days ago, we also launched the digital application process. So all the documents that you have to like submit will be automatically generated if you just type in the answers in a form. So we are trying to like ease all the procedures for setups. And this is something that we are the like, like this is something that we created for the first time in Japan. And so basically what you need for a startup visa. So basically startup companies who wants to land in Japan to start a business needs MVP, minimal viable product, and also business plan and three years financial forecast. That's it basically. And of course, Japanese government also always wanna see something extra. So for example, you need like to show the housing letter, like where you are planning to reside in Japan after you land in Japan and also bank book, whether you can survive in Japan for the first couple of years. And we want to see graduation certificate, employment certificate, and also CV. And also like, it's nicer to like also show your pitch deck and we can definitely help you out to brush up the pitch deck. So, um, but you can attach this document. And if you have MVP and business plan, financial forecast, you are ready to apply for the setup visa. So why Hokkaido? So uh, as I mentioned, there are like several clusters and overall we are pretty still um, like industry agnostic. So anybody can apply for it, but still if you're especially working on agri tech, food tech, health tech, and space tech, travel tech, I highly recommend to come to Hokkaido. And I recommend it because like the speed is like so fast here. So um, Hokkaido government and Hokkaido prefectural government and also Sapporo city is like interconnected and they work uh, closely. So the collaboration is always happening and I see interconnectivity between all the organizations and also um, like decision makers are also connected. So it's so fast to make one decision. And the important thing is uh, some of the people are like from startup. So they know like, like they know how startup feels and like we are working with startup mind. And yeah, that's it for me. Uh, and like we are, we keep always like updating information about the latest news on our LinkedIn. So I will appreciate it if you can follow Startup City Sapporo. And yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So follow City of Sapporo in LinkedIn and that has mm -hmm. up, okay. Mm -hmm. So yep. um, amazing. Why do you think uh, the Sapporo has that faster speed? What is it about Hokkaido? Is it so far away from Tokyo that they're a little bit more adventurous? 
that's one. And also, I feel like uh, people in Hokkaido are very like open minded, and because the city itself was like basically cultivated by frontiers around hundred years ago, it's a pretty new city, so people tend to accept new ideas. And also, the size of the team is not so big. Like in Tokyo, its team is so huge, so that like everything is also siloed. And information is not always shared all the time. But in Sapporo City, Hokkaido Prefecture Government, I see like the team is not too big. So like we can easily talk to the decision maker and they focus on like how to get things done. So that was the very important mindset that everybody should have, especially if we need to work with startups with like with the like fast speed. Fantastic. You uh, looks like you went to college near Kyoto and you've you've done some studies internationally as well. Where are you from originally? Originally from Kyoto. From Kyoto. Okay, yeah. very good. What questions do people have uh, for Tanaka-san? I have a question about the infrastructure for foreigners who are moving to Hokkaido. Mm -hmm. Are there international schools or other programs set up for families for ease of life? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. thank you very much. So, there is some international, uh, sorry, international schools, and especially because, like, as I mentioned, it has uh, like best powder snow. So, like, there are lots of like, especially um, Australian people coming. <laughs> so, there is a school for them, and it's pretty big. So, um, there is an international community there. When I go to like skiing, and like half of them speak English. It's not even Japanese. So also like um, we are launching several financial support for uh, startup founders. So to bring uh, family members, uh, I can, for example, guide through like how to get the spouse visa or like dependent visa. And also like uh, we just created several financial support for uh, startup visa holders. So they can, for example, get 50% of uh, office rent from the city office. And also like they can potentially get up to 2.5 million Japanese yen of subsidy to start their own startup. And also we uh, provide subsidy to cover all the company registration costs. So um, like that's something that I, it's like I couldn't really find even in Tokyo. So they are actually uh, making a lot of effort to attract startups, international startups to yeah, actually diversify the startup ecosystem there. Wow, this doesn't sound like Japan. This is amazing. Uh, everybody, <laughs> we should all look, follow City of Sapporo and uh, definitely check this out. What other questions do people have? Thank you. Hey, Miho and Jason, how are you going? Hey. Um, I don't know if I missed it. Did you say how long it is? Is it, is it one year, the first um, visa? Uh, so the startup visa, um, it's going to be one year. And um, as everybody knows, it's like technically six months plus six months. But also like since Hokkaido um, University and also government collaborate very well. So um, for students, there is a two year startup visa for those like students graduating from Hokkaido University. Yeah. Just wondering what, what happens at the end of the first year when the, the startup is perhaps not yet got any traction, what happens? Mm. Yeah, so like they all need to um, change the status from startup visa to business manager visa. And it's okay if they don't have traction yet, as long as they fulfill all the criteria to start a uh, company in Japan to apply for the visa, which is basically office space, dedicated office space, and also like uh, 5 million Japanese in capital or hiring two full-time employees who don't have any visa restriction. So um, on the first year, of course, like all their startups are like financially struggling. So um, it's possible to change the status even if they don't have traction in sales for the first year. But if they have like negative um, financial status for the two years in a row, immigration can potentially um, reject the next renewal. So it's preferable to have some profit from the at least second year. Thank you. 
Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you. Oh, we have time for one more question. Anybody have a question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, thank you for your presentation today. Yeah, how country, how many companies uh, do they apply for this program? So up until now, um, like last year, we issued like four startup visas. Mm -hmm. And um, this year, like we started all this like process from this May and already like six applicants um, applied. Oh, and from which, which country? Uh, so mainly Europe. So uh, I know, Europe. yeah, okay. one from uh, Germany, another one is from, mm. let's see, European countries, <laughs> maybe Austria. <laughs> mm. And yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, I missed it. And yeah, maybe the skiing and the, the, the snow is a, is a big attraction. That's interesting. I think, um, I think so, yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, thank thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it, Tanaka-san. Let's um, let's now go to uh, Suzuki-san uh, in Tokyo. Suzuki-san, um, thank you for sharing uh, today in advance and tell us a little bit about what we should know about what's going on in Tokyo. Some opportunities, perhaps. Ah, that's a good question. But uh, depending on what industries, Tokyo, as you as everybody knows one of the biggest cities in the world. And uh, you may find so many opportunities here in Tokyo, Japan. Although the situation of the COVID-19 is not really friendly or favorable for overseas people to come in and do business here, as we discussed early, earlier. But um, what can I say, Dagsan? I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm not really prepared for this one, so. <laughs> you, could you tell us a little bit about the kinds of work that you're doing? Oh, okay, well, I'm the second generation of the company and the company was established in 1965, so back to 57 years ago. Since the establishment, we have been helping overseas firms who wanted to come and do business here in Japan. We also help overseas firms who wanted to do business with Japanese mm -hmm. companies located outside of Japan because almost all important decisions are still made at the headquarters, which is sort of uh, global or yeah, global for almost all other uh, companies as well. So few major industries, we are very strong. Long story to short, industrial products, but I'm now getting more into medical products as well and food and so on. So I should be able to cover pretty much almost any, almost all industries, I would say. So that's uh, about me. Tan Tanaka-san, Oyasumi Nasai, thank you for, for presenting. We recognize it's very late there in Europe. Thank you very much. Um, and um, in terms of one of the industries that you know very well is automotive and automotive industry actually was the one that I was very involved with. And I think about Nagoya and Toyota City and all the different suppliers of all the different parts, the picture behind me, that oil seal company in Tokyo, all of that disappears with electric vehicles, right? Or much of that disappears. What are you seeing? What kind of revolution or is it a revolution yet in Japan with electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles? And how do you see that evolving over the next 5, 10, 20 years, considering what's happening in the world? That's a very big question. And probably everybody is wondering. It's not just for Japan, almost all over the world, you know, Europe, in North America and any other countries. So uh, looking at sort of a negative way, it's gonna be a very difficult for sort of a, a typical automotive suppliers to continue their business. But looking at from a positive way, it may be a very good opportunity for new startup or new companies who have very good technologies to get in. Do you find, uh, how have you found companies landing in Japan, the ones that you're working with? Um, do, have you actually, um, do you typically act as a sales agent or do some of them actually move into Japan to set up operations? 
I do both, whatever the client goal is. I have many, by many ways, so. Okay, very good. Does anybody have any questions for Suzuki-san, please? Don't be shy. Alexandra, you've you've gotten to know Suzuki Sun okay. over the last few months. What have been some of your impressions of of the work that he's doing? Oh, I mean, absolutely, Suzuki Sun. I think your work is fantastic. You know, I think just with the cultural differences that exist between Japan and the United States, I think people sometimes think that, oh, you know, it's just another country. I can just kind of do what I've always been doing, just kind of find someone to distribute a product or whatever it is. But, you know, in Japan, it doesn't really work like that. Um, there's a lot of cultural factors that come into play, um, how people will view the product and kind of how you get in with different businesses. Um, and so Suzuki-san, I think your work is incredibly valuable. Um, and it's been just such a pleasure to talk with you and meet you more. So thank you. Thank you too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're amazing. You really are. Uh, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? Like some crazy American or European company coming into Japan and they're meeting Toyota or they're meeting Nissan and they do something totally unexpected and ridiculous and maybe even blew everything. Have you seen anything like that that's kind of blown everything out of the water? Not really. No. Uh, no. I usually can, try to help my client to be prepared for the meeting. So. <laughs> of course. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank you for doing that. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong and you, you avoid a lot of problems. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so our last speaker um, is Andrew Gibbler. So we're going to go now south of Osaka to Hiroshima. Andrew, thank you for uh, helping us with the regional work there. And you're going to give us a glimpse of uh, the business in Hiroshima. Thank you. That's correct. Thank you for everyone's time. Uh, try to uh, summarize some life in Hiroshima. So uh, I'm Andrew. I'm from the U.S. and came to Hiroshima about 13 years ago to work for a baseball team here. Uh, I was a mascot, which is not your normal career path for most people, but uh, got me into business in Japan and quickly picked up the language and was able to do a lot of things. So right now I'm a consultant for real estate, so I'm not a visa specialist, but once you get that visa, I can help place you into a home, um, real good at helping you get used to uh, the living situations in Japan, whether that's trash separation, uh, connecting you to local businesses, etc. Um, I'm also a consultant for different companies in town like uh, Hiroshima Mazda, uh, the Hilton Hotel is opening this year in Hiroshima. And so just going to share my screen and go through a few things give you a glimpse of Hiroshima in just a few minutes. So uh, I have a lot of different sites here, but uh, yeah, just Google Earth is the best way to see how cool Hiroshima is from above because it, it has seven rivers that go through the city as a kind of a delta. Uh, I don't know if most people know that about Hiroshima. So everywhere you go in Hiroshima, you're crossing bridges over beautiful rivers and it's got lots of natural parks. Um, so it's about 1.2 million people in just the city, which is almost half of the prefecture itself. So a lot of people in this uh, small area of Hiroshima. And um, if you look at the sightseeing in Hiroshima, uh, back in 2019, there was over 12 million people, <laughs> almost six to seven times that uh, population came to visit Hiroshima. Uh, about almost 2 million of those were foreign resident, uh, foreign sightseers. And you can see that that number dropped as we're talking about our frustration to about 27,000. So almost 2 million to 27,000 in 21. It's a 98% decrease. Uh, so Hiroshima's businesses have been hurting really badly uh, since the pandemic has happened. So I just real quickly wanted to show you uh, everything that's, you know, been taking uh, place because of the pandemic and um Hold on, I'm trying to move my Zoom tab out of the way so I can click my tabs. I don't have slides, there's some tabs, but Hiroshima is famous for sightseeing because of world heritage sites. Uh, Miyajima Island is just so beautiful. And uh, 
they timed the pandemic perfectly because their beautiful uh, Tory gate here is actually under construction for three years and it happened to start two years ago. Um, and then the, you know, Hiroshima historically, the atomic bomb was dropped here and a few days later in Nagasaki. So the Peace Museum is another reason a lot of people come to Hiroshima. So it's an international town. It's very laid back. There's not a lot of English, surprisingly, in Hiroshima, which is a big opportunity for a lot of uh, people like me who want to help businesses get more to be more internationally because it is their goal. Um, so I actually helped one of the local TV stations to um, make a digital tour of the Hiroshima Peace Park. And um, it's just a fantastic tour. You can see a lot of Hiroshima City and the Peace Park and inside the museum themselves. They teamed up with Matterport 3D uh, digital mapping company you may have heard of. It's a global company. And uh, actually, they use my voice for the narration. So if you want to check out this uh, really cool digital uh, mapping of Hiroshima, you can learn more about the history there. Uh, moving on here. Where is that again? What was this? Uh, this is, uh, if you go to 3D-Peace Memorial Park, if you just okay. search on Google 3D Peace Memorial Park, you can find that. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, I see. Page. All right. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, food, uh, just a quick highlight, the okonomiyaki is a noodle dish that's uh, kind of the soul food here. I fell in love with it, and I eat it once a week. Um, amazing food here in Hiroshima, oysters, lemons, there's a lot of local things. We hosted before the pandemic, the FISE, uh, International BMX and Skateboarding World Competition here in Hiroshima. Mazda Hiroshima has its own factory here and it takes up a good portion of Hiroshima. It's probably a good 10 to 20% of the city on the east side. And you can see from this map from above how big that factory area is. They provide tons of jobs. Um, it says here uh, from just four years, they provided over 13,000 jobs. So uh, Mazda has a sightseeing tower. They have a baseball stadium is owned by Mazda. It's made kind of to have a Western look there. It's just a really beautiful place. So, uh, just to get more talking about the business opportunities, um, I, I like I said, I work for an international real estate company, probably one of the biggest in West Honshu and Shikoku area. We uh, provide housing for company, big companies like Mazda and uh, the Hilton and lots of other international companies coming in. Um, but uh, yeah, this year, especially with the work visa restrictions being removed, finally, I've just been helping hundreds of foreign exchange students uh, that finally have been able to get their visas, get moved into Hiroshima and start their education that they've been waiting for years. Uh, lots of you know East Asian companies that were uh, hiring people from Vietnam and India and different engineering positions or opening curry shops. We have international schools anywhere from, you know, babies up to high school. I know schools was being talked about and asked about earlier. Um, and our foreign population is about 25,000 people. So uh, a lot of those are Asian uh, residents, but we also have a good, you know, small amount of English speakers as well. Um, so one of the things I also do for the real estate company and other companies in town is get them on the map because it's the, unlike the U.S., everybody focusing on their SEO and Google things, they focus on it here in Japan, but a lot of them don't know that newest information from Google. So I use that opportunity to teach companies how when a foreign resident or a sightseer comes and puts hamburger near me or, uh, you know, work in Hiroshima, that how can their company show up on the Google uh, first page and especially on that maps listing, which, uh, so that's one of the things I do consulting for, for the real estate, uh, oil companies, hotels. Uh, with the Hilton Hotel opening this year in Japan, it's one of the first big companies in Japan that actually is recommending English to be spoken in their entire company. So it's kind of surprising because when I first came to Hiroshima, I thought everyone spoke English. It's not quite the case. It's very uh, countryside feel, very different from Tokyo. And so over the next three to five years, there are going to be more big company hotels, kind of like the Hilton, like Four Seasons, perhaps, and other big hotels are going to make their way to Hiroshima. So they're really hoping to branch out. I um, am making English courses for their employees. Uh, I have a, 
a side gig where I make these English courses. And uh, right now we're working with the hotel to train their employees how to speak hotel language English. And so there's plenty of opportunities to do international things in West Japan, especially in Hiroshima. Um, I do international branding with a, a partner of mine for video. Um, and uh, yeah, just <laughs> try to get into the international community here in, in Hiroshima as much as possible. So that's awesome. Yeah, that was uh, everything in a nutshell. Uh, what uh, I'd like to go, if, if I could, to Catherine. Catherine, I'm sure you've been down to West Honshu and been down in that area. Do you have any comments either about Hiroshima or any of the other presentations that we've heard today? I just think that's amazing, Andrew, and I love that you're doing that kind of work there and um, having people speak English at the Hilton, that's going to be amazing, a game changer and helping them out to do hotel English, right? It's a different kind of English and being of service and how you do that. I think that's great. Um, presentations have all been quite enlightening. Um, I didn't realize that about Sapporo either, uh, that they're doing that kind of visa. So I think going regional in Japan outside of Tokyo is really attractive. And I've just realized that today, how much uh, more attractive it is than what I thought. So I think that's been eye opening and how we can expand on that, you know, not only have it all in Tokyo, which seems to be a bit of a, an anchor, a heavy anchor or a heavy weight at the moment, whereas the other regions seem to be just going on with it and getting ahead and doing stuff. Uh, and I love that. So, um, just just inspiring honestly as a tokyo based person to have the regions shining bright and i love it so anything we can do here to help or have you help us would be great <laughs> i very good comments i total totally agree uh, beverly yeah. or kelly or anybody anybody else what are some of your observations or questions that you have well mine, mine is sort of a silly question but are you familiar with devin elliott yeah Devin knows, uh, you guys know each other, right? Yeah, <laughs> he had a similar baseball background, so I was kind of wondering. You want he to explain me. that connection, Andrew? Yeah, he hired me for my job for the baseball team. When oh, I did he? Came. Okay. And he was my interviewer, yes. There you go. Interesting. <laughs> but you know, yeah, Doug, but then I see him is, there's so many job vacancies in Japan now, it's very, very um, hard really? to get anybody. Um, job vacancies in Tokyo, for example, exceeded the number of job seekers by 44% from May to June this year, and it's just increasing per month. And it's interesting that Andrew's just highlighted hospitality. It's the biggest industry looking for people. An increase in 34% of people who are looking, you know, they're needing work, right? Hospital, uh, ho hotels are looking for people to come in and work for them. So hospitality, manufacturing, services, and information technology are the biggest industries looking for people and they can't find them. So if you can come into Japan on one of those visas or you can fill some space where you can work in those industries, at least to start up or get a job in those industries and then go from there to do other things later. But you know, it's Japan is crying out for the, the people to come in and work in these industries. So you see what I'm getting at. We need it in Japan. These industries need it. They're suffering. And yet we can't get people in here because of what's what's going on. So I think Japan's got to realize what's going on, right? Because you can't pull it from the domestic trade. We've got to have people coming in. And Japan's weak economy um, and weak dollar or to the yen, right? is also helping people to come in and, uh, you know, invest in Japan. So it's, we've just got to open it up so that people can come in and do that. It's ironic. So uh, somehow we can understand it, right, Andrew, and all of us understand this. Come on, Japan, is all we want to say, right, uh, and get these things going. Hospitality, manufacturing, services, and information technology. The when you think about, Andrew, what you said, 98% drop in tourism in Hiroshima. Right? And so now people start coming back and who's going to staff all yep. of that? There's plenty of yeah. hotels have actually closed in Tokyo because they don't right. have the staff. So, and wow. uh, managers are rolling up their sleeves to do the housekeeping and cleaning of rooms. So this is the reality of Tokyo in the hosp hospitality wow. industry. And Andrew, you'll know down in your area too. So yes. come on, Japan. Woo. Yes, I, I just want to say for the Hilton, especially it's a huge risk to open a massive five-star hotel like this during the pandemic when we haven't opened the borders 
they are praying probably more than everyone in this room just because their costs per month just to run the hotel and to staff it is insane. Yeah. And so if the borders don't open soon, uh, they, they're going to be hurting. And so. The Marriott chain, they opened the beautiful place in Nara, their, their latest hotel, they opened that uh, a year and a half ago. So, you know, it, it can be done. I've stayed there. It's an amazing hotel. So people are doing it, but you're right. They need the staff to clean the rooms, to be doing hospitality. And it's a great trade to be in in Japan. You, if you're going to learn how to do hospitality, this is the place to do it. Service, 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 right at top. So mm. I, I see uh, Matt Slowinski in the room and it says Chiba next to your name. So are you just getting closer to Narita Airport? Is that what you're doing? Or maybe you've always been in Chiba or do you do you do you have a moment to just kind of weigh in on what you're hearing and anything you'd like to share? I, I actually just moved in um, March to Japan. So um, we were we were in um Melbourne in Australia for yeah like that's where I'm from and then um but we were my wife's Japanese so we've always been in Japan and doing business in Japan um just you know obviously traveling so but now yeah we live we live pretty close to we're in Kashiwa actually in Chiba so it's um Kashiwa Noha it's like a smart city hub actually the one of the the government has this smart city sort of campaign big 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 project they're doing and there's different cities across Japan they've launched um as like a smart city so lots of yeah it's 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 a lot you can look it up but um yeah anyway so that's where I am and um congratulations yeah, I, I, I haven't been I haven't been on a call for Global Chamber for a while just because of the relocation and everything so um but yeah it's good to be here and and see familiar faces as well and, and Jason I've been talking to Jason Ball a lot as well offline on LinkedIn and places like that so yeah it's um Good to see everyone though. So I, I I do a lot of work in video and video marketing um, and specifically in tourism and travel. So, um, and it seems like there's a lot of momentum now with tourism, like like the projects with the government usually or different um, prefectural governments. So they seem to be starting to push more on the tourism marketing and advertising. So I guess there's some sort of movement we don't know about, but um, something happening. <laughs> But hopefully sooner than later, we get borders open, like everyone's saying. So. <laughs> it sounds like they need videos to encourage workers to come to Japan at some uh, point. Just, just listening to that now, I'm just like very curious about that. That's uh, like like uh, employing, yeah. I mean, foreigners, it's a big, big, uh, big market for Japan if they can tap into it. I guess the only thing would be is like language. How, how, what would the expectation be for language for Japanese hospitality companies, like maybe they'll have to relax a little bit with the language requirements, but like, um, I, I, in a way, I feel like that would be the only way forward if they really need the workforce. But um, yeah, but um, yeah, th th that's a good point. And it's something to think about for sure for, for, for companies and for projects in the future, like maybe they need more video for uh, employment campaigns. <laughs> so. I'll tell all my friends there's openings in Japan. I didn't know that there was such a large opening in Tokyo, like like 40%. That, that's a drastic number. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Uh, yeah. Jason, do you, do you have any comments, Any anything in closing for you that you'd like to, did you learn anything today? I mean, you're so connected to both Japan and Australia. Your business in Japan group within uh, LinkedIn is historic and monumental and iconic. And so thank you for your work there. Anything you'd like to close with today? Are you there? He, he, he did mention in a message to me that he has to be at work at nine and he might have to sneak uh, away around then. So I think I might have just missed him. Okay. Yeah. He, <laughs> he's, he's got honest work now. That, that's awesome. If you can hear us, Jason, thank you for joining. Uh, uh, and so Catherine, would you like to make any closing comments for today? I think I've made quite a few, Doug, but yeah. I just really, yeah, I mean, the sooner, the sooner we hear any information that's going to help uh you to get here next year so that we can have an event in person can't wait for it but you know we continue to support japan seriously and um we'll get in any information we can to you about anything that opens up when we see some glimmer coming through the the cracks okay 
yeah, can't be too far away, but. Mm. You know, in terms of uh, our next steps at Global Chamber, there are certain cities where we're still looking for entrepreneurs to, to mm. take on roles. We, as Alexandra knows, working with Jetro has been a little challenging, we'll say, you know, in terms of timeliness, but I will never give up. We're going to continue to move forward, but we have gaps in Sendai and Aomori and Niigata and and I still believe in Okayama because I used to travel there a lot and I've just loved that mm -hmm. whole area of West Honshu the Kurashiki kind of like yeah. the Osaka Kobe Kurashiki Okayama all the way down to Hiroshima I uh, just have a lot of, and even Shikoku Island I would I mean I'd love to have somebody out there because I miss the crabs and the prawns or whatever those things are that they that grow out there the seafood to um, uh, Tanaka-san uh, mentioned earlier in Hokkaido. I mean, the seafood everywhere in Japan is amazing, right? You know, so so uh, we definitely look forward to having things open um, for sure. Uh, Alexandra, would you like to make some closing comments? Uh, gosh, I mean, I think personally, I learned so much just about um, different industries and about the need right now in Japan. Um, and so as a student, you know, I, would hop on a plane any day to go to Japan. So I'm just really looking forward to when that'll open up. And hopefully um, I plan to study abroad next year. So hopefully by then um, things will be in the clear and maybe I can meet some of you in person. So that would be great. But just thank you everyone for your time and um, to all of our presenters for your wonderful advice. Thank you. When you say study abroad, are you thinking like for the summer semester or, or longer than that? I might do either six months to a year. I'm not sure. Wow. Okay. And would Japan potentially be a place that you do that? Oh, definitely. I There's a program at Pomona called the Associated Kyoto Program, um, where you do some study at Doshisha University and live with a host family. So that is the one that I have my eyes on right now. Okay. Is that in Tokyo? Uh, Kyoto. In Kyoto. Okay. Very good. Okay, well, I think uh, Kelly is—is is your wife from Kyoto or Nara? No, she's from Tokyo. She is. Okay. Why do I keep saying that, Beverly? You grew up somewhere out there, didn't you? Or Beverly still there? Somewhere out there. I, I I was in Kobe most of the time, but my my young life was in Shimane Prefecture, so I was I was very near Hiroshima as a young child. Oh, okay, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Does does anybody else have Kelly or Beverly or anybody else on the call have any any either questions or comments or closing statement you'd like to make? Well, really I'd appreciate like to, I'd like to say thank you very much, Doctor. Actually, a lot of good information today. Yeah. Which, which some of these things I'm hearing for the first time, and I have a son, and I'm going to tell him about the hospitality industry. He's, he's in his early thirties. Can get him, yeah. get him over there. Okay. How old is how old is your son, and what uh, would he be? Uh, he's, he's in his early thirties, and his Japanese is pretty good. So, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. so there's a there's a door opening, uh, an opportunity. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if he's interested. Okay. Very good. Uh, anybody else? I can just say I've got my fingers crossed because I have purchased my ticket to Japan for next spring, but unknown if I'm going to be going or not, but certainly hope to be. Uh, I hope it works out. Which month? March. March into April. So. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. I don't Beautiful. need to be on a tour. <laughs> okay. You see a few cherry blossoms, uh, undoubtedly. I'm hoping. <laughs> I, will, I will just say quickly that I have friends in uh, who have travel agencies on this side, in, uh, sorry, on the other side in Australia, and they are saying that um, They've, they've just gotten advice saying that they can have unguided tours. It's just that they have to monitor somehow. It's up to them, but it's not like, but it still has to be packaged to it through an agency. So that's, that's, uh, I guess everyone might know that already, but um, the, the difference is it's like you could, de someone could deviate and not tell anyone and that's the risk, but like it's sort of like babysitting from afar, like through an app or something. So um but hey, like that's that's a good step. So we're I think I think we're safe. I do think that it won't be we won't be seeing uh, closed borders past like March. I think it'll be open before then. So um, good. That's my that's my uh, take on it. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, very good. 
Uh, Vilma, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And uh, Terry and, and everybody else, I probably missed somebody, but thank you all for attending today and participating. I, I second it. I think there was some really great information here today and let's let's keep moving forward. And as things open up, it sounds like there will be some unexpected and some expected opportunities that develop. Um, and then so let's keep uh, leaning forward. Uh, and if you do have uh, some information about some of these other cities, Shizuoka actually is another area that's fairly populated. Um, but we haven't been able to find anyone there yet. So we're continuing to look and, and find. And I think once we get a little bit more opening at Jetro uh, and a little bit more participation, maybe some things will open up. But if any of you have some ideas or run into entrepreneurs uh, that are open to some uh, new ideas with Global Chamber, we're happy to, to, to chat with them. Uh, it is now... a. 10 minutes over, so I apologize for my mismanagement of the meeting, but I think uh, we all learned a lot and hopefully had a good time. Thank you for attending and participating and we really appreciate your support. Special thanks to Catherine for all your amazingness and, and support and Alexandra, you're very special. Uh, thank you for all of your help as well and thanks to everybody. Have a good evening for those of you here in the Americas and have a good rest of your day there uh, in Japan. Thanks, Doug. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Oh, hang on.